Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, really uh, looking forward to the day, and I've enjoyed the talk so far. So, um, I'm a neurologist, as it says there, so I know next to bugger all, as I might say bugger all, next to nothing against, uh, uh, about cancer, so anyone has to answer cancer questions, uh, keep them to yourselves. Um, but anyway, so, but I, what, I, what I really want to get across is uh, new duration is important and where I think the symmetries may align both biologically uh, and etiologically. But new generation has been neglected. Funding, I was talking with a colleague earlier this morning here uh, about the lack of funding that's gone to new generation. And yet more money is spent on, on dementia than is spent on cancer, cardiovascular and diabetes combined. However, 98 or 99% of that is on care. And it's very expensive to look after people who are dementing because they can't do much for themselves, particularly in the latter stage of the diseases. And so it's a huge, huge burden. And not surprisingly, most developed economies are thinking very hard about how to combat this. They've got some of the costs there, 40 billion pounds, uh, sorry, 40 billion euros uh, across the EU. Obviously, post-Brexit, we may say, who gives a damn, but that's something else. Um, but the other problem we have for neurogeneration is that we don't know much about the pathways. So this is an old slide, I've had this for a few years, and you're not meant to be able to read this. Cancer's been a huge success, and those of you who are cancer biologists in the room will know this. You know, in the last 30, 40 years, huge numbers of pathways and complexities of the molecular pathways have emerged, and importantly, many of those steps are now druggable in some uh, way, incompletely in perhaps. Neurogeneration looks a bit like this. It's a bit better, this slide is a few years old, say, but it's a bit better than that now, but it's certainly a lot more patchy. And the idea is how are we going to get our picture for neuroration looking like that? That's part one, and that's really what I've been driven by for the last 10 years. But also, it's, it's all to come up, and I'll talk a bit about this, is, is actually there's a bit of symmetry, there's a bit of uh, parallel work going on with discoveries in cancer uh, uh, that have insights into uh, neurogeneration and vice versa. So turning to Parkinson's disease, so I started working on this 20 odd years ago. I was interviewed for a lecture position um, at, at UCL and uh, they said we want you to work on Parkinson's disease, which I was not very impressed with. It was clearly a non-genetic disease. We all knew it was non-genetic. The epidemiology, the twin studies, the rather uh, small scale association studies that had been done at that time had all shown in inverted commas, there was a non-genetic disease. There were three families published in the literature at that time, and neurologists like myself would spend days arguing about whether it was the say, whether it really was Parkinson's disease or not. There was too much dementia, it was too early onset, it was too this, it was too that. And that's where the field was at 20 years ago. However, and I'll show you very briefly in a moment, so it's been hugely successful and fruitful for the field uh, to be working in this area. And I think that's been driven by the fact that the phenotype, complicated though it is, is actually reasonably constrained. So even though it's not a very heritable disease, that if you take the phenotype of tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, you have a very high prediction of a certain type of pathology, the Lewy body shown on the uh, end of that uh, slide here, and that has a rather limited number of pathways to the disease. And I think we're picking up that limited number of pathways with, with genetics. So uh, this is a brief summary. There are a few more Parkinson's Mendelian genes than this, but these are the main ones. And what I've done on the right-hand side there in preparation for this talk is say, what the role in cancer? I mean, this is a loose, these are mutations that have been imported in cancers and so forth. And you can see there's a lot of them. In fact, none of the major Parkinson's disease are free from some putative role, and it is no more than that at this stage for many of these conditions, many of these uh, proteins in cancer pathogenesis. And that got me thinking a few years ago, and we put a, put a couple of opinion pieces out about five years, four or five years ago, uh, saying, can we learn something from the other field? Can, and if, in essence, I wondered whether new generation could piggyback on some of the success that's happened in cancer, both in terms of uh, molecular pathway uh, description and also uh, molecules to uh, step forward. And this is what uh, has sparked some of our interest. But we have huge problems in new generation research. Problems that, cancer has its own problems, but we have different ones. 
First up, we have the nervous system, um, uh, which um, I won't coin Woody Allen, but it's a very complicated system and, and um, important. Um, we have real difficulty with disease definition. I mean, defining cancer may seem complicated enough, but it's not that complicated compared to uh, when you've got, say, dementia. Is it frontotemporal dementia? Is it this type of dementia? Is it that type? Is it Parkinson's? We, there's huge congresses on all these topics. And not surprisingly, if you've got that diversity, you've got a lot of difficulties in um, having a coordinated approach to it. I actually favour the, the mindset that we should be thinking about pathways to disease. We talk about disease phenotypes. This is Parkinson's. This is Alzheimer's. This is whatever, ALS and so forth. But actually, we should be thinking more like biologists as, as clinicians and think about what is it about the molecular pathways that are driving that disease state. And I'll touch on that as I go forward. One of the major problems you have is access to tissues. If you have cancer, you have it removed. That's part of the therapy. If it comes back, you have it removed again. This gives biologists a chance to have tissues at different parts of the evolution of disease. They get different chances at the treatments, so the disease has been, the tumor has been treated, so they can see the evolution of mutations that emerge in cancers. We don't get anything like that in, in neurodegeneration. We get the slow, progressive decline, as spoken about by the previous speaker. We do get the brains uh, post-mortem sometimes, but you then you're looking often at the tombstones. You're looking at the cells that have managed to survive the process of the disease. The, ones that, the cells you're really interested in are the ones that have already gone missing. And so we have problems there that are going to be difficult to, uh, to come by, to combat. And then finally, we have model systems. It is difficult. You know, working on mouse uh, biology uh, in cancer fields has been very productive indeed. Working on mouse models in generation has not been so productive. You have to usually do a huge biological perturbation to, in order to uh, uh, get something that looks like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's in a mouse. You have to overexpress a protein, massive fold. You have to age it well beyond uh, sort of a normal thing. You have to stress it in some way. You have to give it some sort of uh, noxious poison and so forth. And so we haven't got very good model systems. If I return to the genetics for a second, so uh, a plot, this plot uh, in essence was shown in the previous speaker for Alzheimer's disease that at the left hand side here you've got things that are rare in a community, often very rare indeed, but when you've got them they give you a very high chance of disease and at the far end of the brown end you've got things that we've all got and that we, if we have a selection of these uh, variants that increase our risk of asthma, diabetes, in my case Parkinson's disease and so forth. If we do uh, if we think about that for Parkinson's disease, there's been huge success in uh, mapping Parkinson's disease genetics. These are just some of the major papers that, have, uh, that the group uh, that I'm part of have put out over uh, the last few years. And as you can see, rather significant numbers. And the map for Parkinson's disease now looks like this, that we've got a number of high penetrant Mendelian factors in the sort of dark grey. We've got in the light grey a bunch of... Uh, uh, commonly occurring variants, and then we've got somewhere in between. And this, is, this has all happened in the last 15, 20 years. In fact, it's the 20-year anniversary of the first Parkinson's gene being cloned about, literally this month, uh, and that's happened in this time. If we start to think about, okay, what's the evidence of a tie in between these two diseases? Somebody asked the question to the first speaker where it's just chance, and I think that's still a very fair question, I have to say you can start to think a bit about some of the epidemiology. And I'm just briefly going to summarize some of the things here. So there is, and so if you've got a risk of colorectal cancer, you've got a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease. This is just one of the fairly recent studies uh, that, that came out. And these are well-designed. I like epidemiologists. They really have thought very deeply and hard about uh, how to design things to minimize the biases that, uh, that can ensue from just doing purely observational studies. Somebody asked about prostate cancer about half an hour ago. Here's a very large study. Uh, Denmark has very good, and Scandinavia generally has very good registries for diseases. Uh, and so they do very good population-based struct uh, uh, structural studies. And again, an overall risk reduction of Parkinson's disease of about 27%. Uh, some uh, nice meta-analysis uh, published by Bajaj, uh, with Jenny Driver involved uh, just a few years ago. And in essence, you can see here that the, if you have um, uh, Parkinson's disease, you've got a decreased risk of cancer and vice versa. 
there are, is an exception to that, and the striking exception is melanoma, that there's repeated studies show that if uh, melanoma and Parkinson's have a positive uh, correlation, uh, again, shown in this meta-analysis, look at the bottom uh, diamonds there, the overall risk is about one, one and a half um, stage risk of the disease, so modest but significant of very large studies. Okay, so we've got these observations. We've got overall decreased risk um, for Parkinson's disease and cancer, negative correlation, and you've got one example of a positive correlation. So we can ask a question with combining genetics and risk and say, what about melanoma genetics? What do we know about melanoma genetics, and does any of that light up when we now look at these rather deep data sets that we have for Parkinson's disease? And the answer is not a lot at the moment, even with this resolution, even with this scale of activity that we've got. Um, so MCR, uh, MC, MC1R is a polymorphism um, that's associated with risk of melanoma. But it's, now there was a report in Annals of Neurology a couple of years ago showing that it was a risk of Parkinson's disease. Um, a larger scale secondary study by the uh, International Parkinson's Disease Genetic Consortium uh, did not confirm that, in fact, showed complete uh, unity. So we have to wait and see who's right on that. You then can take a rare variant view. You can say, okay, well, let's see if there are any uh, disease Mendelian-type mutations, level of mutations coming out in melanoma genes. And the answer of, of the resolution of this size of case controls is not a lot. But this is rather modest. If you, if the cancer biologists in the room, often now can sequence, they've got tens of thousands of cancers or cancer patients have been sequenced. So I think we still have to keep a bit of a health warning on that. But at the moment, we're not seeing a lot. You can do the other way around. You can look at all these Parkinson's genes I've mentioned in passing. And do any of those have any risk for melanoma? And it does appear, as a paper uh, last year, showing that you've got an excess of Parkin deletions, PARC2, the second Parkinson's gene to be found uh, in, cancer, in patients with melanomas. And I'm going to return to this uh, uh, gene in a moment. Okay, so the circumstantial evidence are best with those bits of data. But can we think of other areas where there's some molecular commonality between the two diseases? And I think the striking one is some of the recessive ataxias, and this is a story that's been around for a few years. Interestingly, though, it's only come to the insights of most neurologists in the last few months, in fact. I had a colleague who works in this area, came to me with the news and views from Nature, saying, look at this, DNA repair is important for new generation. And I said, well, yeah, but we've known about this for some of these genes for a while. So it's, it may be well known to the cancer guys in the room, but to new generation, uh, less so. So this, the most well-known one, of course, is ataxia T. lentactasia. This is an early onset, really unpleasant disease. It gives uh, children this balance disturbance due to patho pathology in the cerebellum. But it's a multi-system disorder. It affects their nerves, so they get a neuropathy as well. They get telangiectasia shown here in the eyes. They sort of look like it's not really bloodshot. It's like this spindly blood, red blood vessel. Um, but they get humoral immunity problems, and uh, they get uh, cancer risk as well. In fact, their parents, the heterozygote carriers, obligate carriers, are also at slight increased risk of cancer as well. And this has been known about for uh, 15 or more years. There are some other uh, diseases that look much rarer than AT is rare enough. Some other rarer diseases, uh, Nijmegen breakage syndrome and so forth. Um, and these all involved in dou DNA double-strand DNA breaks. And it can't be by chance, talking about networks or a little bit of a sort of network, if you like a molecular network, that these are so closely aligned in the same pathological molecular process. So this surely indicates, I think, that DNA, double-stranded DNA breaks are obviously important for cancer. That's been known about for many years and researched by many groups. But also, it must be telling us something about the pathogenesis of cerebellar neuron fallout and other parts of the nervous system as well. DNA single-stranded breaks, uh, have, this is a more recent uh, discovery in the uh, neurological field, at least, uh, with a, uh, AOA 1 and 2 coming through and so forth. And then just uh, a couple of months ago, a paper in Nature came out uh, showing that uh, mutations in this gene XRCC1 uh, show this is a loss of function, these mutations, recessive mutations. 
uh, when the, this, uh, the, this family, this case in fact, uh, had loss of this protein, they activated PARP and uh, had problems with single strand breaks. I was, I think I'm allowed to, I'm a, I was a reviewer for this paper. Um, I think the other reviewers were the guys who wrote the news and views, so I think we now know who they were. But anyway, and the biology was beautiful. I mean, it really is a, a really impressive piece of work. Genetics was one case. If this had gone to a good, stand, good standard uh, genetic journal, it would not have been accepted because finding one case, albeit with mutations which were likely to be pathogenic, with great biology, is persuasive. We know now with very large scale sequencing, we've all got stuff bad in our genomes. Um, so it, it was not, uh, you know, not entirely genetically proven. Uh, we haven't published it yet, but we've looked uh, behind now uh, in our cases. Um, and we found this mutation, this one here, we found this in two more cases homozygously. So I, th I think it's, I think that they were right. I thought they were right at the time, but I think uh, this shows that they're right. Um, so this mutation is turning out to be uh, this gene is taking important insights. You can also use genetics to uh, inform on um, interactions between sort of hardcore Mendelian genetics and GWAS signals. And I want to give an illustration of that, uh, which I think has uh, been instructed in the last uh, nine or 12 months or so, maybe two years. So the polyglutamic disease is probably, uh, hopefully well known, certainly well known in neurological circles. There's a, there's a family of these disorders. They all due to abnormal uh, repeat lengths of CAG in the coding bits of the gene. They encode glutamine, and so known as polyglutamic diseases. And you're allowed, it varies from gene to gene, you're allowed about 20 repeats or 20 glutamines and that's okay. You get 37, 40, depends from disease to disease, that's bad and you get this often, nearly always fully penetrant disease. So you can have, you can have 35 polyglutamines be normal, have 38 glutamines and you get this disease, a very tight switch between normality and pathogenesis uh, and they cause Huntington's disease and a bunch of ataxias. I went to a Gordon conference 10 years ago and I was giving a talk on these, on the ataxias actually to the mostly an HD group. Um, and, I, and I was just saying, you know, what you guys want to be doing is you want to be doing a GWAS of the variance that's not explained by the CAG repeat diseases. And they said, absolute waste of money. We don't want to be doing that at all. We know what most of the variance is. We know what the gene that causes disease. If you either have this mutation, you get the disease. If you don't have it, you don't get the disease. And we're not going to be interested in it. So I didn't do anything with it. So I don't, well, I had, it was the idea. But um, we've known for a while that if you have the repeat length, it predicts the number of repeat diseases. But then a very nice paper a year and a half ago came out from Jim Tusella and others at Harvard and the big uh, genetic consortium showing that when they did do a very large scale GWAS for the other, the better, the bit of the variance of the age of onset that was not explained by the CAG repeat, about 70% is explained by the CAG repeat length, the other 30%, they did a large scale GWAS, they showed uh, a number of gene regions, uh, most prominently two on chromosome 15 and one on chromosome 8. They did some network analysis. I don't know how, if, how much this would impress our first speaker. Um, uh, see, it's not floating ground. Do you think, do you think, do you think, could you help me with my slides? <laughs> no, I lifted this um, from their paper. But the, the, the message is, apart from my crappy slides, um, is it was kind of persuasive that actually a rather simple idea came out, and it was to do with DNA repair again. Um, and you've got a repeating mutation here. So this had a kind of um, believability about it. We'll have to see whether it's right. So a follow-up group, this is something I was uh, small, I had a small part in, uh, involved in, uh, published last year, looked at the other scars, looked at the other CAG repeats, because it seemed to me a pretty obvious question really is, okay, is the variance that you've explained with these uh, GWAS hits explaining just HD, or does it explain other CAG repeat length problems. And so it's a simple question. So we took the sort of 22 top SNPs from the, the first paper, applied them to a much smaller number because these are generally rarer diseases. And you can see you find significant values and the direction of effect is in the same direction. It's in the opposite direction. We'd have been a lot more worried about it. So it seems there are genetic factors out there that regulate or control in some way the uh, 
variance of onset for a whole range of polyglutamine diseases. And now you can start to speculate. It is only speculation at this stage as to what, how this might cause uh, disease risk, whether it's to do uh, with to do something to do with somatic mutation. Is it the fact that um, if you've got DNA repair abnormalities or, or preponderance in certain ways, that in the brain tissues of these patients, in some of them who've got the risk alleles, they have longer repeats inside the brain than they have in their blood. And that's why they get earlier age of onset, i.e. their biological age is different to their, if you like, their chronological age in this sense. Or is there some other mechanism? I think it's very early days to uh, say more detail on that at the moment. I would give a little word of, word of caution. GWAS are mapping strategies. They tell you uh, where something is in the genome. So if you took a look at this, uh, this is the... Uh, so this is uh, GWAS from, these are both GWAS hits from Parkinson's disease. And if you, um, this is uh, chromosome 4, you've got a whole bunch of SNPs, uh, 10 to the minus 25, so a really significant p-value. There's really only one gene in town, alpha-synuclein. If we had not known about alpha-synuclein from Parkinson's disease, from Mendelian genetics, we'd have got it from our GWAS. However, many of them look like this. The top SNP here is 10 to the minus 8, and there's a whole bunch of genes in there, and some that we have not even listed. We do not know which gene's in there. So when you see a mapping saying it's clearly this gene because it fits some biological plausibility, I think you've always got to be a little bit uncertain what's the genetic evidence of the mapping strategy for these things. And that's true for all GWAS, that's not just to do with what I'm talking about today. If we try to build a sort of understanding of the pathways of Parkinson's disease to return that moment, we can map on some, some pretty well-established molecular processes now. We've got some protein folding abnormalities, amongst other things. We've got lysosomal biology. We've got mitochondrial biology, all in some hand-wavy way leading to neuronal death. Uh, and I just want to uh, pick on these uh, for the moment because these are important for Parkinson's disease. This is something uh, we've worked on for a while, so, uh, but also it's starting to tie in with the link with cancer, as I'll go on to show you. So there's a lot of work, uh, this is by our group, but there's lots of other groups uh, working on this. Uh, but basically, it's got a my pink one, we discovered it in 04, it's got a mitochondrial targeting domain, so we knew, we knew it was going to mitochondria, we went on to show that as amongst other groups. And there's a whole range of mitochondrial phenotypes that can be robustly uh, measured and discovered in mouse models, in neuronal cell models, and so forth. And it, um, it, it often to do with um, calcium um, influx into the mitochondria and its knock-on effects on, on reactive oxygen species. So there's a reasonably hardcore biological readout you can, you can obtain from PINK1 derived uh, knockouts. But I've been really struck by these two, there's two papers back to back, uh, ten, over 10 years ago now, uh, on Drosophila, and they've sort of shown the, the, the importance of some animal models in terms of discovery things. So blue is wild type, pink is knockout, and orange is the rescue. Um, and you can see if you've got the knockout flies or the cells from the flies and you poison them with different things, all the cells do badly, and you can rescue it by re-expressing pink one. Okay, so far so good. Um, but they also did some uh, other rescues. Here is the wild type of the, uh, um, of the thorax. Here's the knockout, and here's the rescue. But this time, it's not rescued by pink one. These flies are still deficient to pink one. It's rescued by Parkin, and the reverse experiment doesn't work. So they've shown that pink one is north of Parkin in, in the fly, uh, and that they're in the same pathway. Pink and Parkin are both recessive Parkinson's genes. So this was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. The chance that that was by chance and not going to be useful to mammalian systems like humans seemed a little unlikely. And over the last 10 years, that's been shown to be true. These genes, Parkinson's genes, are in the same pathway. A third recessive Parkinson's gene was found about six, seven years ago, FBX07. And um, it's part of one of the FBOX proteins. And it, we, it's, it, we wondered where there was going to be a specifying agent for an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And I'm telling you that because it turns out to be the true. And so we ended up with a model, um, we and the field, that looks a bit like this. Here's your mitochondria. 
you, you uh, we're depolarizing, we're damaging it. It's a highly uh, reactive oxygen species um, rich environment all the time. So this is slightly damaged mitochondria, right? I better get a move on. Um, uh, when that happens, you decrease cleavage of pink one, you increase the non cleaved, and this acts as signals to recruit parkin, which is a cytosolic protein, uh, which then ubiquitinates mitofusin, which stops mitochondria fusing, so they can't fuse, and so you're de pushing it down the degradation pathway. And off it goes. And this is obviously, you can imagine it's being very tightly regulated. To the last few slides of the previous speaker, neurons need to be able to regulate turnover of these uh, mitochondria, otherwise we're going to be in problems. And you can imagine getting pushed towards new generation quite quickly. Now, the reason this might be important for cancer is shown in this recent paper by um, uh, just published about two weeks ago in Molecular Cell. They looked at a whole bunch of cancers and showed a st staggering amount of deletions in Park Two, Park In, uh, in of angio cancer, 69% of cholangiocarcinomas uh, carried mutations in Parkin, which sounds a lot, I mean, I don't work in cancer, but that sounds an awful lot to me by any measures. And they showed that if you, would, if you had abnormalities in Park, Park 2, you had decreased survival as well. And so they gave very strong evidence of this being an important uh, tumor suppressor gene. They were going to, to speculate how it might work in the PI3 kinase pathway, a pathway that will be well known to the cancer biologists in the room. And I'll move on. Okay, so the final a few slides to tell you where I, th where I think one of the areas we should, should be thinking about how we can combine fields and make some insights is Mendelian randomization. So the idea here is uh, that we get our alleles distributed at birth randomly. Uh, and those alleles encode proteins, of course, and those proteins do important things for us. And if we can direct, if we can understand what the exposure, that, what, what the protein does in terms of the risk of an outcome, we can use, get some insights into the causality of the disease process. So let's just take something, for example. We know uh, variation in the FTO gene drives, in part, BMI, our weight, um, and we can ask questions about whether BMI has an impact on Parkinson's disease. It's been well known, I mean, if you're a neurologist, you, you never see an overweight Parkinson's patient. Never is an exaggeration, but hardly ever. They're always skinny. Now, are they skinny because they've got a terrible disease and disabled and they're sitting still uh, and wasting away? Are they skinny because they're moving around with their tremors and burning calories? Is it part of the illness? Or is there something more causally related? We can ask questions um, based on genetic predictors of BMI, because there's now been large GWAS done on people who are various weights, and we know how to capture quite a lot of the variation between our BMI, and we can say, since they were distributed randomly at birth, we can ask questions about how that drives our absolute BNI. This is a paper that's just been accepted um, in PLOS Medicine. should be out in a few weeks, I hope, or a, few, a month or so. Um, that basically, if you're chubbier, you've got a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease. And it seems to be driven by the weight itself or the BMI itself, not just um, genes because of the method. Now, we can use that to think about treatments for cancer and neurodegeneration, which is where I want to end up. We could either do this model, which is sort of guess, or part guess, and, and, and that's been a model that's been successful for medicines, some medicines, but as we heard about in the last speaker, it's been terrible for a new generation. We've really done very badly indeed in having new therapies for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and so forth. Or we can think about ways of harnessing genetics to at least tilt in our favor or against a favor of a given pathway. So the standard method of developing a drug is this. You, have a, you, have think, you've, you think you've got your disease, you get your target selection, you drive through all these phases, and at this point, it's when it gets really expensive. Billions of dollars are spent to go to a phase three study, and that's where uh, the most expense is, and it's where most of the failure is. When you ask a drug company why the failure is, if you ask them 30 years ago, the failure was often at this in bad, badly designed studies, and they've learned an awful lot and do very good studies now. The failure is not because of that. The failure is nearly always at this end, and so they've made we, the field, we have made big errors of target selection. And can we do better? Can we drive it? So we can think about Mendelian randomization as our nature's own randomized control trial. So 
I said before, they randomly, so RCT has done, you randomize the patients, you give one an intervention, one placebo, the target is engaged if you've picked the right um, chemistry, uh, and you get your outcome. And if you, um, and now if you think about the target of those drugs, it's always, nearly always encoded by a gene, and that there'll be variation in that gene which will reflect the impact of the target. And I'll give an example of that. So here we've got a compound. It's binding to a target protein. It's enco encoded by a gene. Of course, the classical one would be a statin, which many people may be in this room or even on. And you have this huge impact on disease. And you've, um, you, your statins lower cholesterol by one millimol per liter, cardiovascular risk 25%. Here you've got lowering LDL cholesterol, 0.07, coronary risk resistance, 6%. But this is based on genetics. So the variants that mimic the action of the statin do modest effects. But you've got much larger numbers for free because these have been genotyped already. So you don't have to do your RCT. You can just go to a genotypes of these patients and say, can you see the same effect? And the answer is, you, we would have discovered statins using this methodology. And what I want to finish on now is maybe we can think about trying to do that for all the drugs that have been around the cancer field. Some of them have been binned because they do the opposite of what is required uh, uh, for cancer. Maybe some of those may have traction in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases if it's right that we are looking at the other sides of the coin. But we can certainly ask the systematic question of saying, can we uh, engage this methodology to... Uh, look at the targets, because those targets of those proteins or the biologics are known. We know the DNA variation within them, and can we use them to predict the effectiveness of uh, treatments? Has it worked? Yes, it has. This is an example from uh, rheumatoid arthritis, well-known uh, monoclonal antibody binding to IL-6R with this phenotype, sort of, you know, uh, fingerprint, and here... Uh, you can affect on cardiovascular disease again, um, big impact um, with the same fingerprint based on the presence of that SNP, which is mimicking the action of that drug, if you like, in a more modest way. And so I think this holds great promise for really short-circuiting that pathway from basic discovery through to therapies. So finally, so I think the evidence about the interplay is still circumstantial. It's looking less circumstantial as the months go by, and I have to say there's a lot of interest, and I was delighted this meeting was being put forward as a result of that. I've been struck both by the two talks earlier today, and I'm sure this will come out in others as the day goes on, is we often speak a different language as fields, and I think we really need to uh, think about how we combine approaches and combine uh, thoughts to really motivate uh, further discoveries. Thanks very much. We have time for a few questions. I have a rather naive question. Do you think epidemiologically there are certain population groups or demographics that have less risk of developing Parkinson's? Uh, yes, it's a good question. Um, well, there's some population groups have an increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease, so you'd have to say if they were... If you took them as your norm, the, the rest of us have a lower risk. So Jains, for example, uh, from parts of India, uh, have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. So I, I suspect the answer is, is yes to that. I don't think it's massively variable. I think you do see Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, for that matter, in, in all ethnic groups. So I, I think um, it's not going to be a big player. But yeah, I'm sure that's right. And is that also true for cancer? Other than melanomas? Um, you know, I don't know. I, um, I'm sh well, I cert well, when I was in medical school, which was a while ago, um, you know, the certain cancers are certain commoner in certain populations for sure. I mean, I remember getting told gastric cancer was common in Japanese populations. I assume that's still the case in working gastric cancer. I think that's still the case. Uh, colon cancer is commoner in people in where we eat a lot of red meat. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure there are things uh, like that true. I guess the question I had was whether we could use that information to narrow down correlations between these conditions, right? Yeah. 
No, I, I th yeah, I mean, it would be nice. I mean, so, so epidemiological studies, I, I say I'm a fan of them when, they, when they're done really well because they give usual insights. And what you need, I think, with something like that is, is to transplant people from low risk to high risk and move them around. And you're not allowed to do that. Even your president isn't allowed to do that yet. <laughs> I'll stop making jokes. I will not make any more Trump jo any jokes. It's too serious. It's going to be the best. <laughs> All right, next question. Is sun exposure a risk factor for Parkinson's disease? Um, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's answered that. No, not that I know of. I don't think anybody's looked at it. Uh, you think about the sort of melanoma type stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody's looked at it. Uh, do you know if anybody's looked at um, sun exposure and PD or other risks? Right? Yeah, people have looked at um, disease that's like related to hair color, pigmentation, um, and like. And they've not shown up in the GWAS of Parkinson's as a sort of surrogate of that. If we look at people who've got ginger genes or whatever, or freckly genes, they don't seem to have, uh, the, the, the variants that predict that phenotype, physical phenotype don't predict Parkinson's, so I suspect not, but. Um, I, <coughs> sorry, um, I think, y you know, both your comments and the previous speaker's comments about the sort of the difficulty of crossing disease disciplines is, a, is I think, is a very, you know, important statement. Do you have any, um, ideas for how one kind of shortcuts that, uh, how you get the cancer ideas beyond the neurologists and vice versa. I mean, I, I've run into this in my career too uh, over time because biology is just biology. The cells don't really know what they're doing or anything like that. And yet uh, I think, you know, th there are things that we can learn like, you know, with cancer, you, you commented about melanoma and, and Parkinson's melanomas in the skin. Parkinson's is in the brain, but they're both part of the early same tissue, right? Yes. And that may, be, that may be where the link is. And at least in cancer, you get the tissue. You can study the biology a little easier. If you know what, what it is you're looking at, it maybe tells you more about Parkinson's, even if you're looking at skin. So do you have any, any insights into what one can do to, to push that interdisciplinary yeah. idea oh, well. through? Because um, I think it's a problem. Uh, absolutely, I think it is, and I think um, I would hope it would be really great if one of the outcomes from a meeting like this is it's a start of conversations. Uh, I was interested by the first speakers. You know, here's a physicist engaging with a whole bunch of biologists and things, um, and that's it. I think it's trust. You know, you've got to be able to trust the other person and uh, engage. You've got to be able to speak the same language, uh, and I don't just mean English. I mean, I'm just, I mean a sort of biological language. You've got to uh, uh, be sensitive to the limitations. So I go to. I went to a a meeting that was quite a lot of cancer in it at the Crick Institute in London a few weeks ago, you know, and th they're miles ahead, uh, not just the Crick, I mean, biology, g cancer biology generally are miles ahead of where new generation is in lots of ways. But then I read some papers of cancer where they talk about mitochondrial biology in cancer, and it's quite primitive compared to where new neurosciences are appreciations of mitochondrial dysfunction because we've been around mitochondrial dysfunction. So there are lessons to be learned. I don't have a magic solution. Um, I think it is going to come down to personal relationships where people say, I really need a, you know, a certain type of biologist to help me with this or a certain type of genomicist or big data person. And I, you know, but I think it'll be done with conversations. We have time for one last question. Great. And so I thought that your approach to the polyglutamine diseases was really interesting. And it's based on the notion that there's a common underlying biology for those sets of conditions. A lot of people in the neurodegenerative field think that there's common biology between Parkinson's, Huntington's, CTE, the tauopathies, the synucleinopathies, and all of these different things. It has a similar approach to risk alleles for protein misaggregation or those sorts of processes been uh, taken across diseases? So, um not for some of the diseases you mentioned um, because of the asymmetry in the population sizes. So for Parkinson's, we can get to 15,000 more cases now. I should have said there's going to be another paper coming out in the next few months, I think, with more genes coming out, with Huntington's will be 2,000 or 3,000. So there's an asymmetry in the sizes. There was, you know, when we did the Parkinson's GWAS some six, seven years ago, we talked to the Alzheimer's guys and I would have bet, well, not a lot of money, but a bird amount saying there'll be some commonality, there'll be some risk factors which increase your risk of new generation and some that don't. And actually, 
there seems to be no, virtually no overlap between the two diseases, which is, was a bit of a surprise to me. I would have thought biologically you'd expect a few alleles. Now, it could be the, you know, then we were talking maybe of just having maybe two or 3,000 Parkinson's cases and there maybe four or 5,000 Alzheimer's. Maybe we do a better job if we have another look. So people are looking across two big neuro, neurodegenerative diseases. People looked at ALS and Parkinson's, not found very much. Of course, ALS and overlap with frontotemporal dementia is a well-known thing in terms of Mendelian uh, forms of the disease, but I haven't seen a GWAS showing interactions yet, but I think you just have to you keep, look, keep your eyes open, really, keep one's uh, eyes open. Thank you so much.